So you're probably wondering why I've called you all here today. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, making infrastructure s'mores with Chef. So if you were looking for um, you know, how to make apple pie with Puppet, that was the last session. So I'm sorry, I promise it'll be funnier from here on out. It is the last one of the day. So as I said, the name of this session is Making Infrastructure S'mores with Chef. This is gonna be so hard for me to like stand in one place. I promise if you can't hear me out, I'll fix it. Uh, making Infrastructure S'mores with Chef. And I will tell you, this is a fairly tool agnostic talk. So I will give references that have to do with Chef because Chef is what I know, but I'm hoping that you can take away these ideas and apply them to however you're doing your work. And my name is Matt Stratton. So who the hell is Matt Stratton? So, uh, oh, hey, surprise, I work at Chef. Uh, <laughs> up until recently, I was a senior solution architect uh, at Chef. Uh, I, I live in Chicago, cover the Midwest. I've now moved into our customer success organization where I'm a customer architect, so I design customers, apparently. Uh, <laughs> I've just moved along, so now I work with customers that are current customers as opposed to selling them things. I am the uh, creator and co-host of a podcast called Arrested DevOps. Uh, so if you like podcasts and you like DevOps, you should listen to the show. And I am one of the organizers of DevOps Days Chicago, which is coming up uh, August 30th and 31st. The calls for papers are open through the rest of the month, so you should submit one of those and you should come to our event because it's rad. Uh, and yeah, that is my license plate. My car does say DevOps, so I guess I buy into this stuff. And you can find me on Twitter as at Matt Stratton. That's pretty much where I am everywhere else as well, but mostly hanging out on Twitter. And up here on these um, table, black tables, I've, excuse me, I've got you know some contact stuff if you want to talk to me about something. I've got stickers from Chef and ADO and all that, so sticker up your laptops. So let's talk a little bit about what is Chef and why do we care? So the first thing is there's three key things about what we're talking about that we do with Chef. The first thing is that we're going to use Chef to define reusable resources and in our infrastructure state as code. That's a really big statement that says a lot of things, so I'm gonna unpack it. So the first thing is we're defining things, right? So you may hear difference of opinion about an imperative versus a declarative configuration management, I've got no time for that, right? You know, the declarative is XML and nobody wants to use XML. But what we mean when we say we're defining reusable resources. So a resource is a thing we care about, right? It can be a file, it can be a service, it can be a package, it's a thing we care about. We're, we want it to be reusable because we don't want to repeat ourselves, right? We, and it, we, the most important thing here is it's infrastructure state as code, and that's what I want to deconstruct. Two key parts of that. State. It is about the state of our infrastructure. It's not about how you get there. It's about the state, desired state. The also imaginative Microsoft in their tool that's like this, they call it desired state configuration as opposed to something cool like Puppet or Chef that's a lot more fun, um, but it explains what it is. And then as code, and I'm gonna get into that a lot more later as to what it means to treat your infrastructure as code. Chef can be used if you're managing your deployment, your ongoing automation, so it's about day zero, it's about day 300, right? You need to spin up some new machines, you wanna make sure that your existing machines don't suck, you're using a tool like Puppet or Chef. And there's community content available for all common automation tasks. These tools have been around for a long time. Sorry, no matter what clever thing you think you came up with, someone's already had to solve this problem for you. Uh, this is the problem that I have. I sit down and say, wow, you know, that I'm gonna go write a rad cookbook to go do this thing. And then I go, oh, somebody already did that. Shit, I guess I'm not gonna be known for that. I did find one thing though, and I wrote a cookbook for a tool called guacamole, which is a, a session sharing thing. So, but what does it look like, right? So like the, the thing that I love about something like uh, declarative configuration management tools like this is so this is, this is legit chef code here, right? For doing a very basic install of Apache. And chances are most of you sitting in this room don't know chef from puppet from, you know, Perl. Well, maybe you know Perl, I don't know. But you should be able to look at this and get an understanding generally speaking of what this is doing, right? So we're saying the thing we want, the state we want it to be in. So think about it this way. You talk about what you want, not how to get there. We focus on the outcomes, not how the sausage gets made. That's just sort of the thing to think about with that. 
and we're talking about full feature parity with Windows and Linux. In my examples, I may be talking about Linux stuff. If you're win you do Windows things, we're, we're living in this weird alternate universe where Spock has the goatee and everything, where you know Linux runs on Azure and Canonical does stuff with Windows, and everybody's friends, and it's weird, but cool. And somewhere there's a really sucky alternate universe where everything's horrible still, right? So what does this mean, right? If, we, if we're going to talk about DevOps, and, and before I dig into this, I'm going to ask a couple of questions just to kind of do some level setting around what DevOps means, because obviously I have feels about this, given my license plate. So how many people that are in the room here would more identify themselves within your company today as more of the development side of the organization? How many people would more identify with the operational side of the organization? How many people consider themselves more of the business part of the organization? All right, every single hand needed to go up for that last one. That right there is DevOps, okay? There's no the business. We're all the business. Um, unless you're a consultant, then you're your own business, right? So we want to think about what DevOps means, though. It begins with automation, because automation gets a lot of crap out of the way so we can do smart things that are using our big brains and using our good resources. So automation means we need to treat our infrastructure as code. What does that do? If we get to treat our infrastructure as code, why do I want that? Well, one thing is it lets us version our infrastructure and our runtime environments. So I didn't really give my bio here, but I'm a grizzled old sysadmin. I've been most of my career, I would raise my hand for that op side of the house and try to hit the ceiling. Most, spent most of my time as a system administrator, as a sysop, and one of my trigger words is it worked on my machine. Right, or it worked in dev. So uh, if we can simply, within our different environments, understand what's different about them or understand what version of our code and our infrastructure is working, that makes our life a lot easier. It lets us create our infrastructure and runtime environments consistently. I love this screenshot I did where it's got a, a spelling error, right? The, the squigglies are under ENVS. So you can tell that I got this from screenshotting out of a, another PowerPoint. But the, what, what's important here, and we think about the loveliness that is promised to us by containers, why everybody loves containers so much, is there's this myth of, I shouldn't say myth, I just revealed an awful lot about how I feel about containers. Uh, there's this belief that, oh, it's great, I can define this as one way and then it'll be, I ship it everywhere, right? Guess what, we've been saying this since Java, if not before, right? Right, once, run everywhere, all this crap. So the idea though, but if I'm creating my infrastructure and my run times consistently, this is going to help me have predictability, right? I, it's this again, all works back against this. It worked fine in dev. And then it also lets me test my infrastructure automatically. It lets me have predictability around what these changes are going to do. Oh, that's awesome. That's actually <laughs> super ironic right there. So, I feel so, so much about them that I will uh, remind me later there, Dr. Whale, that I'm running the beta. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, and this is recorded. That's beautiful. Awesome. Jason's going to, like, splice out just that one bit and put that on, like, a Vine or, like, an animated GIF on Twitter. Okay, so what, when you talk about infra, and the, the thing is, the key of that, the big reveal till the Docker whale stole my thunder, is that this is just like what we talk about with applications, right? Our apps, we treat them the same way, whether we're talking about our infrastructure, our compliance, whatever the hell it is. Insert Mad Lib noun as code. So, the key of, uh, I'm really getting mad at Docker now. Okay, so the great quote about infrastructure as code by uh, Jesse Robbins is that when you treat your infrastructure as code, this should enable the reconstruction of your business from nothing but a source code repository, an application data backup, and compute resources. So that means if all hell goes loose, as long as I've got my source code, I've got a backup of my data, and I've got compute somewhere, I can get my company back online. We'll very quickly digress to story of two infrastructures. Um, so one of them was a company called Code Spaces. Anybody remember these these folks from a few years ago? Yeah, that's a re this, you can see where this story is going. Code Spaces was a hosted uh, source code provider that, that uh, like GitHub, but wasn't just Git. They supported Mercurial and SVN and all sorts of stuff. They ran in AWS because the cloud, right? 
<laughs> Dave's starting to remember them a little bit. And they got slammed. They got, it's actually a really interesting story to read about how they were hacked, but it was a kind of one of those looping IM role AWS attacks where every time they try, you know, someone got a hold of their creds, they try to go reset them, they'd get reset back from underneath them in circles and circles. Now bear in mind that they had backups, right? So this is just remember this. They were like, they dutifully were cron backing up their machines and everything. And after, I think it was about six hours of this, they determined the cost of rebuilding their systems was worth more than the company was worth and they went out of business. Then on the other side, we have a company called Custom Inc. If you've worn cool conference t-shirts, you've probably worn a Custom Inc. shirt. They make lots of t-shirts uh, for things like that. So Custom Inc., they were hosted in a colo and they happen to be a chef customer, but the point, important part is they're using our infrastructure as code, got hit by a DDoS attack, a distributed denial of service attack. And because they treated their infrastructure as code, they were able to rebuild everything in AWS in the span of about four hours and be back online and route the traffic over there. You can see a similar story with Facebook's um, acquisition of Instagram. So uh, Instagram and Facebook both use Chef. And so what happened when Facebook bought Instagram, Instagram was hosted in AWS, Facebook went, oh, AWS, that's cute. Um, we're gonna move you into our data center now. And they were able to very quickly and easily migrate that stuff. Now the 6.2 billion photos is a whole other story and there's a cool Wired article about that. The whole idea is like you wanna be compute agnostic. I wanna have the same thing whether I'm running a VM on my MacBook, whether I'm running dev in AWS, whether I'm running production in Azure or on metal in my data center. So. What does it mean to treat your infrastructure as code? It means three main things as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, here are the memes come. Uh, first of all, it's versioned. My infrastructure is versioned. And versioning does not mean .bak at the end of a shell script name, right? Or even the more elaborate .112, you know, 2016 or whatnot. It's versioned in that it's a version of the state. It's modularized, which means I'm thinking about it in terms of what these different components do, or you could say it's componentized, right? I have little built for purpose parts of it, and it's tested. That is what we're gonna talk about for almost the entire rest of this talk, is how important testing is when it comes to InfraCode and to your environments. So one of the things that's super great about uh, when, we, when we treat our infrastructure as code is it provides us with executable documentation. Uh, this is the part when I go ahead and say there's a couple things, like my joke that all wikis are write only. Um, but even more, but that kind of conflicts with my real point, which is we think back a little bit to the olden days of 10 years ago, maybe, some people maybe 10 weeks ago. And so I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna build a system, or I'm gonna make a change to my system, and I'm gonna go to the wiki, I'm gonna dutifully, like a good sysadmin, go and I'm gonna update and say, this is what I did, right? Now, you know, uh, NTP is listening on this particular port, I've moved, you know, the file system from, you know, data is now in slash data instead of where it was before. And that wiki is now the obituary of exactly what my system looked at, like, at exactly that time. The thing is, if you remember back to when y'all looked at that chef code I had in the beginning, you didn't know chef, but you could understand what it did. So if you have your infra, your configuration management is running regularly, this is the other thing, don't do this thing, a lot of people are like, oh, well we can't make changes much, so we're gonna have Puppet run like once a month. That's scary as hell to have your config management run once a month, because holy crap, is that a lot of stuff to change. <laughs> How do they know when it's needed? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm gonna make, yeah, any, any time, we're gonna get to a slide later entitled Beware of Hubris. Um, this reminds me of when I worked for an e-commerce company and we were doing A-B testing, right? And so we said, okay, during the test, there can be no changes, right? And they're like, oh, but we can change these things because we know that won't affect the test. I'm like, well, if you're so smart and psychic, why do we have to test it all if you know what it will affect what the user does? So the thing is, think about, yeah, if we want it, it's continually running. And the, well, the reason for this is it's managing configuration drift. Configuration drift happens when one of two things happen. It happens when your desired state and your current state don't match. That can happen for two reasons. One, desired state changes. You want something different than you wanted yesterday. Current state changes. Someone went and screwed up your shit, right? So either way, you want to have chef or puppet or whatever. And I'm, I'm going to just keep saying chef, and you can manually like you know search and replace for chef and puppet for that right now. But you want to have your system go ahead and just take care of it for you. 
So here's the reality. Let's think about domain expertise. This is the part when I say there's about 16 full stack engineers in the whole world and they all work for Netflix, so stop thinking you're gonna hire them, okay? Systems are really complicated today. There was a time when someone could understand everything in your environment. And depending upon the, the type of company that you're in and what your software stack looks like, it is possible to understand most of it. But, and, and depending, again, depending upon your organization and the larger organizations with more complex systems, and that's the direction that all of our systems are going is, is, in, is complexity is increasing, it's not decreasing. Expecting somebody to understand all of them is crazy. And so nobody can know everything about the stack. What you want to do is let your domain experts contribute their portion directly. So as the sysadmin, there, as someone who's a system administrator, there's stuff I know really well. I have my domain expertise. And I have like a passing knowledge of, you know, maybe a higher level language or microservices or something like that. Similarly, as, a, as someone who mostly writes code, you know, I can really know my code language. I can know application architecture super well. And I have a passing understanding of networking. That's cool. That's a great person to be. But to expect me to be a CCIE at the same time as someone who can write deep libraries in C and to be able to do every single thing there is to do, these are mythical people. And you certainly can't afford them, even if they exist, because they're all consultants, because they can make more money working for themselves. So the thing to bear in mind, the reason this comes into play is when we talk about our configuration management and our automation in general, a common play in a lot of organizations is to have an automation team. And they will say, and, and that team can be made up of one person or can be made up of a dozen depending upon the size. No matter what it is, it's wrong. Um, I don't usually say there's a wrong way to do things. This is one of those things. This is the wrong way to do it. And what happens is all you're doing is moving your silo around. So if I sit there and I say, okay, so I've got my complex applications, and I'm going to spur off, and I'm going to get two people. I'm going to say, guess what? You are now the chef people. And anytime we have to, we're going to automate the hell out of everything. And you are going to write the chef automation for everything, for the infrastructure, for the middleware, for the applications, for all this. And you go, oh my god, now I have to understand all that stuff, right? So that's, that's a thing that really sucks. And this is why we want to beware of hubris, right? This is where we bring in my, my friend Guilfoyle um, from Silicon Valley who all good system administrators aspire to be more like. So a lot of times what we do, and this is why it makes that, that distributed work hard, is we lock down systems to protect them, right? We're in a regulated industry. We have compliance requirements. And if I sound like I'm being sarcastic, it's because I am. Um, everybody has these problems, whether it's a formal or an informal regime, we have things to protect. And we often think that the simplest way is to reduce the surface, right? If we reduce the number of people who can touch a thing, that's gonna reduce the attack surface. The, the problem is, I will assure you that these, that protecting against mistakes based upon job title is one of the craziest fallacies in our uh, infrastructure uh, industry today. I can assure you that these very same sysadmins who insist that only they, by virtue of nothing more than job title, should be trusted to touch systems, will happily tell me war stories over a couple of glasses of whiskey about when they totally effed up everything in production because they accidentally typed the wrong command. We are all people. So that's the problem with separation of concern based upon, okay, because I'm a sysadmin, I can be trusted. Truth is, chances are I know my stuff, but I don't know your stuff. So this is the way that everybody responds at this point, usually, especially the sysadmins in the, in, the, in the room are going, wait a minute, you're telling me anyone can do anything? Um, and that's not what I'm telling you, right? And don't worry, it's gonna be okay. We've got the magic DevOps pixie dust to help us out here. So this is how we're gonna be able to work together and not have this world of anybody can do everything, everybody's got root, YOLO mode, right? DevOps does not equal YOLO. So the old way of doing stuff is communicating via tickets, right? So um, I'm a middleware guy, I'm, a, I'm an app guy or whatever person, and I need something changed at the system level. So what am I gonna do? I'm gonna put in a ticket to the sysadmins that are gonna say, I need the heap size adjusted on, the, you know, on Tomcat for me, right? So this sucks because I'm explaining things in English or another human language, and there can be all kinds of room for misinterpretation there, right? And maybe I'm gonna give you a script. Like, that's advanced, right, communication. I'm atta I've attached a script to the ticket. Please run this script. Still, 
I, the person that's taking it, I don't necessarily know what's going on. And one of the most frightening things that I've ever experienced with this um, was at, at a uh, certain e-commerce company I worked for that was in the uh, multifamily rental business, and they have commercials starring Jeff Goldblum now. Um, they rhyme with schmamartments.com. And we had the rule that, again, any database changes had to be run by the DBA. Cool, rad. Okay, so that's your separation of concerns. We're going to have Mr. DBA person is going to run the changes. Well, of course, who knows what the change has to be made? The app person, right? The developer's like, hey, we have to change the schema because my thing needs a thing. So what do they do? In the ticket, they attach a SQL script, and the DBA happily just goes, okay, I'll run it. Doesn't look at it, doesn't understand what it does, but the button got pressed by the DBA. Therefore, auditors are happy. Oh my God, this is crazy. No good. So hence, old and busted, throw it out. This is the new way. We communicate via code, okay? And because ultimately, what is a version control system but basically a communication tool, right? It's a way for developers to communicate with each other about changes they've made, uh, sometimes through typing in actual messages and oftentimes, and better, the things that you don't have to remember to communicate because the system does it for you. So bear this in mind. People make mistakes, right? And uh, this doesn't scale. You aren't going to fix the humans. So we're going to fix the system. If you are in an organization where people are punished for making mistakes, do you think that is going to make people make fewer mistakes? It's a rhetorical question, but you all silently, psychically answered it correctly to me, which is, of course, no. What you are now have now done is built an organization full of subject matter experts on hiding mistakes. And now you are well and truly screwed because you have no idea what is going on in production because everyone's hiding everything. As uh, my colleague and friend Sasha Bates is fond of saying, if you treat developers like children, they will act like children. That's true of anybody, but especially developers apparently. So how do I make sure that nobody messes stuff up? This is a new slide for this talk. I don't know if you guys know about this one. This was that dog who got in the toner and like, the, the people, like, they left for, like, four hours. The dog came, they came back. And it's beautiful because it's hard to see, but there is only one footprint, paw print, on the bed. It's like the dog realized, oh, wait, I'm not supposed to be on the bed. Um, but so, you know, you're like, man, I, I've, I've heard about this DevOps thing. I've listened to some podcasts. I've, you know, it's all hippy-dippy culture stuff, right? Isn't it all about trust? Can't we just have people do whatever they want? Well, no, we can't, right? Again, we're, we're trusting, but... It's not about trusting that someone won't do something malicious. So testing is the key. And this is a book that everybody in this industry should read. It's Sidney Decker's The Field Guide to Understanding Human Error. It is the most important book for us, meaning people in IT, to read. It's, got a, it's very accessible, and almost none of it is about IT. But guess what IT is made of? People. You're, you're working with people. It's like soil and green. So the thing is, we're not worried about people doing something malicious. Not saying we shouldn't be worried about that, but more often than not, when someone screws something up, it's not to like be an evil, malicious hacker that's going to steal like a half a cent off every transaction. It's because they didn't know what they were doing, right? It came out of ignorance or out of a mistake because we're humans. So if we think back to this idea of communicating through code, if you have people who care about things, they should be part of the code review process. This is the part when, when I'm explaining InfraCode to a room full of ops folks, and they're like, oh, this is scary, man, because they're like, I'm not a developer. I don't know any of this developing stuff. I'm like, you absolutely do. We just call it different things. <coughs> we don't call it coding. We call it scripting. We don't call it code review. We call it change control, you know, things like that. We don't, or we don't call it peer review, right? Or we don't call it testing. We call it debugging. But they're all the same skills. So in, in the older way, and, and maybe one might even call it the ITIL way, um, again, I won't get, that would be a whole other two-hour talk that I've already given, uh, we, you'd have change management. How many people have currently work or have worked in an organization that has formalized change management? I'm sorry. It's going to be better eventually. Uh, but let's think about that, right? So if the way you can replace that, if you're making a change, because this is the concern. A lot of times people are like, oh, well, someone's just going to go and change the chef code, and then there was no change control ticket. What the hell? We're like, but it's code. It doesn't get deployed unless it goes through change review. 
and a uh, code review. And then who should be looking at that? The people who actually care and will understand what will happen. So we're going to talk about how we can do that. But let's think about back a little bit, and this is me tying it all back into the title of the talk, because that's important. So let's think about to when I gave the example before about saying we've got our automation team. So if you have, and even if it's not an automation team, even if it's something where a lot of times people will say, okay, well the sysadmins, they're gonna, they're gonna be in charge of Puppet, because that's a sysadmin tool, right? Okay, they'll do all the, the puppetizing of the stuff, right? Well, if you have one team that does everything, your s'mores kind of look like this because all that that team knows is the graham cracker part, right? So what, what happened in reality, again, when you have an infra team, you know, a, a server team that writes all of that, they are gonna like config manage the hell out of all this low level system stuff that's great and everything like that. And then it's gonna be like, okay, and then dump your code in this folder and then go do your thing. Cause I don't know how to do your stuff, right? Then if you don't, this is what happens if the teams don't collaborate. This, is, this, this happens more often than you might realize, or maybe, you, maybe you're not surprised, when you have the app teams and the system teams and the middleware teams, and they all go and build their own pipelines and they use their own tools, and you're like, great, the system team is gonna use Puppet, and they're gonna use Jenkins, and then the app team is like writing their stuff in Chef, going through Chef delivery, and the middleware team's doing this. Well, this is what your s'mores look like now. They're beautiful marshmallows that are delightful and chocolate and everything, but they aren't integrated in any way, shape, or form. And then the, one of the possibly worst things you can do is actually have a group that knows nothing about you, either because they're completely separate and don't actually have any domain knowledge of your systems because there may be, I don't know, um, an outside consulting group that doesn't get to know you, and then your s'mores look like this. Uh, so this is also why you don't hire somebody to come and write your automation for you um, that being said, you can certainly hire somebody to come in and help you with it, but uh, the last thing you want to do is pay somebody, an outside contractor, to write you a bunch of puppet modules or chef cookbooks and then leave, unless you like to continually paying those people. Um, so, by the way, if anybody in the room, if that's your job, I'm sorry for screwing your whole, you know, snake oil thing. So, um, so yeah, so how do we solve this, right? So we kind of understand the problem. So what are some of the things we can do to make life better with this? And this is where I might get a little more chef specific, but there's similar tools, and Dan and I were actually just talking during the break, so I'll talk about uh, how you might do this with Puppet. So one of the big things is, this is just one of the, the many testing approaches you could have, is using a tool called Food Critic. And what Food Critic is, is it's, it's like a linter, it's more, I always explain to people, it's like a style guide for a chef. So the community has kind of come together and said like, okay, this is what good chef code looks like, right? So the first thing is it's gonna help you with things that would make your cookbook fail, period, right? So Food Critic Rule 10 is just saying like, if your search syntax is bad, it's just gonna say, yo, this is bad, Beep, get out. And then there's also style and convention that's been adopted by the community. So Food Critic Rule 4 is saying, okay, here's a better way to do it, right? I could write it, and without getting too deep into like the chefism of it, but I can, in chef, I can say, run, you know, service start nginx, food critic's gonna look at that and be like, did you know, it's almost like Clippy, right? So it looks like you're trying to start a service. <laughs> did you know there's a better way to do that? And because it runs against the static code, and I know the, the core developers in the room are mad at me for calling it static code, but I mean, like just the files, <laughs> the tests are very fast. The food critic against your whole cookbook or something like that will take like a second and a half. And Puppet Lint is very similar, same idea behind it. Um, now the thing that's really powerful about this, so we talked about, you're like, okay, that's cool, so that's at least making sure I'm not writing total crap, but how do I make sure that people don't do things that I don't want them to do in general? Forget about what the community thinks, what about what I think? So you can also write custom food critic rules, and this is an example of one. And for example, let's say you're saying it's really important that in our organization, no one is allowed to mount disk volumes, right? We, we hate that for some reason. And so by writing this rule that's relatively simple, if I run Food Critic against any chef code that would result in a, in a um, disk volume being mounted, it will fail. And the reason that this is cool is because this happens early in the process and it's fast. So as developer type people, we should all know that the closer to um, in injection of a defect that we detect it, the cheaper and easier it is to fix it, right? If I discover five seconds after I write some crap that it's crap, it's way easier for me to fix it than to discover it six months later and have to go back and be like, well, what the hell was I thinking when I wrote that? So the same thing. The other difference is, 
anything like this is this could get through, this could come out, and then like six months later, someone's looking and going, holy crap, why is my you know, front end server got this external disk volume mounted? And now I have to go back and figure out who did it, and the person who did it can say, I don't know that I wasn't supposed to do that, and then you go, but look, here's the giant tome of things you shall not do. What do you mean you didn't read this whole thing? So we're making it interactive is the point, right? And that's kind of what it would look like. The idea is this, again, is much better to see as an output than you know, some nasty gram from the security group six months later, something like that. This is the real key idea. Use a pipeline. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, your infrastructure doesn't live in a vacuum. Things depend on each other constantly, right? Your front ends depend on your back ends, depend upon where your code is, depends upon where your load balancers are. And so what that means is I don't really, it doesn't really do me enough good to just sort of test and say, well, I wrote some infra code that configures a web server. Sure looks good. Fire it out there. I want to make sure that it doesn't go ahead and break something else, right? I want to make sure that I understand where those pieces and parts come in. And that's why the ideas of continuous delivery apply themselves really nicely to infrastructure code. Why, why does this matter, right? Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is ensure that whatever system you're using, whether it's Puppet, Chef, whatever the thing is, the only way that your infra code should be able to be deployed is via Git, right? Via source control. That's your interface, right? You don't get to go and say knife upload cookbook this and fire it off or run an Ansible command or do whatever. You want to make a change, you change it by going into source control. And then that kicks off your pipeline, which will auto which is going to make sure that it has the appropriate automated gates and the appropriate human gates. So a couple things to think about just in terms of um, the ideas of the difference between continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment, because they matter, even though they're confusing and continuous is hard to spell. Um, so I, I think a lot of people are super familiar with continuous integration. We've theoretically been doing it for a super long time. The idea of, of continuous delivery is, so in continuous integration, we're saying check in off early, check in often, right? We're saying every time I make a change, commit it, make sure it builds, shit ain't on fire, yo. That's continuous integration right there. And don't check in to master at 4 o'clock on Friday, you know, if you'd like your friends. Continuous delivery is kind of the natural progression of that. We're saying, great, continuous integration tested to make sure the build didn't break. But guess what? We're doing more than building our software. We actually have to deploy it. We have to release it. And so if we think a little bit around what our businesses want and what, what, a, what businesses in general want and what scares the bejesus out of sysadmins and uh, people who carry pagers is if people are, <laughs> so think about this. If you're someone who every time software is released in your organization, it means you spend the weekend in the data center and then they come to you and say, we'd like to do this more frequently. Wow, would that suck. So that the idea of continuous delivery is one of the key principles is that releases should be boring. They are dull, 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 dull. No excitement. In fact, I'm not even going to buy you pizza. It's that boring. So the way we do that is that we're continually practicing, right? And then in order to enable us to do continuous delivery, we have to automate as much as possible, which means our stages that our pipeline goes through have to be exactly the same as production except for scale. If there's any way you can do that manually, hurrah to you, because you found some people that are willing to work for next to nothing but are really smart. And the key idea of that is that the problem with, before we do automation, these tasks, like uh, the way I used to release software, is development or whomever would provide me with this document called a PMI. And it wasn't private mortgage insurance. I learned about that a different way. It was production migration instructions. It was this giant Word document that said, these are all the things you should do, except for the 20 things we forgot to tell you you need to do, because we did those a while ago. Waterfall. And the problem is, so I'm going to sit there, and then I'm going to do those instructions, and then they worked in QA, and that's fine. And then I'm going to go, and I'm going to go try to release it into production, and it didn't work because things were slightly different there. So the whole thing is everything needs to look like production except for scale. But all of those items I was telling you about that were being done manually, they were super boring and super mundane, yet they, required to be, they were required to be done by someone with a high level of technical skill. And to quote uh, Jez Humble, and the, the writer of the book Continuous Delivery, and just so you don't think this is my clever statement, uh, 
Asking highly skilled people to do repetitive and mundane tasks is the surest way to introduce error short of sleep deprivation or inebriation, okay? You will actually have more mistakes. So we need to automate the hell out of this stuff. And all the way through, so that was boring, so it's predictable. And the thing that makes me feel good as an ops person is if I know what's gonna happen when we push the button, when it becomes the business decision about when we release the software. The idea should be the change is ready to go anytime. We know, hey, our stuff's good. If it's not, we pull that crap out and it doesn't make it past. And then whenever it's the appropriate business decision, okay, we need to release this feature today that's been ready for two weeks or whatever. Now we can push that button. It's not about let's, let's, let's move towards that. It's what makes us all feel good about it. So think about this now. We want to use some type of automated compliance as our final test in our pipeline. A lot of times when we talk about testing in a pipeline, we're probably thinking about two kinds of tests. We're thinking about functional and regression, right? So, or, or you know, or smoke, right? Regre well, regression, we're, we're, we want to make sure that we didn't break something that wasn't broken before. And we want to make sure that the new thing does the thing we expected it to do. That's testing as far as the, our entire industry is concerned, except for those poor people that are called security people who have a whole other way of doing things. And we like never invite them to meetings or do anything because we hate them because frankly, the worst job in the world is working in InfoSec in an enterprise because you are the chief no officer. Um, so we need to make that better. And this is how we're gonna help make it better. So think about this. Audit of some kind is something we're likely running on our production machines anyway. Almost everybody is subject to formal or informal compliance regimes, right? Some people are subject to formal ones, HIPAA, PCI, SOX, all those things, I'm sorry. You know, but almost everybody has informal regimes. You have standards in your organization that say, hey, we don't, you know, have no root password on our servers, right? You know, we disable password, you know, password logins over SSH, things like that. So we're likely running these audits. Now, the thing is, most of the time when we do compliance auditing, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the audit, what I call uh, compliance theater. So I've been under a lot of different types of audits in my day in different organizations, and compliance in an organization from a technical perspective usually looks like this. Because here's what happens. Okay, I'm doing real work. Oh, 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 we got an audit coming up. Everyone's gonna pay attention. We're gonna fix all the stuff that's broken. Cool, we passed. Okay, now let's go do our work for a little while. And then we're gonna slowly have some rot because we're doing our other job. No one's paying attention to anything. Oh, 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 time for that quarterly audit. Okay, let's pay attention again. So that sucks. So at any given time, and you're investing a huge amount, th this part here is a huge amount of effort. And you're doing nothing but that during that time. So. What, if we think about making our audit testing, or our compliance testing, if you will, in an automated fashion, and I'm not talking about like static code analysis that's reaching into like your variables and your methods to make sure you're not doing something hacky. It's just talk, think about as audit as acceptance testing for your infrastructure as a whole. You know, using something like InSpec or ServerSpec or various different testing frameworks. Because think about this, Chef and Puppet are good at doing what you tell them to do. Because again, I'm sorry, I know I said there was magic, DevOps, pixie dust. Chef ain't magic, okay? Computers do what we tell them to do. So I can tell, Chef will put things in the state I declare. I will say, I declare, I do declare, that there should be a service named Nginx on there. However, I don't say, but what I really care about is, is my damn website running, right? Is something listening on port 80? So my spec testing is gonna test for that, and that's a type of compliance. What's the state when everything has been applied? So since we are going to be running these tests in production against the real live stuff, we should be running it against our code before we release it, because something that really sucks is I sit there, I'm happily chomping away at my infra code, that's cool, let me release that an hour later, security scan, hey, guess what, Matt, you just made an insecure system, and now I gotta figure out how to back it out, and that all sucks. Wouldn't it be great if I could have known that before I released it? So we wanna test our infra code against our standards before it's deployed. We don't wanna find out about it six months later during a pen test. So uh, Julian Dunn at Chef is fond of saying that security and compliance are just another aspect of quality. So uh, think about this, the way that uh, a lot of folks tend to work. We, let's say we're doing an eight sprint project, okay? We're gonna chug away, we're not gonna really give too much of a crap about security or compliance until we get to that last sprint and now we're gonna have a hardening sprint. 
where we're going to run all of our security and compliance tests. And guess what? None of them are going to pass because we haven't thought about it. So now we got a problem. So we can either not release our software. That's not going to fly because the salespeople went and sold all this shit already. So we got to release it. Um, or we can just throw it in the backlog and be like, well, we'll get to it when we can. And we all know what happens to non-feature you know, feature backlog items, all those wonderful tech debt things. And, and hey, maybe we'll get an exception from security that says it's OK to have this giant gaping hole in your security. Well, guess what? The bad guys on the internet don't really care that you have a note from your mother that says it's OK. Um, sometimes they say signed Epstein's mother, but not everybody remembers. Welcome back, Connor. So the problem is we don't want to tack this stuff on the end. Because imagine, what if I said that for quality? What if I said, let's do a project. And for the first seven sprints, we're not going to test crap. And then we're going to do all our QA testing in the last sprint. If that's the case, you probably worked at apartments.com. But if not, so again, treat it like quality. Security and compliance are first class citizens. This is the only slide where you'll see Etsy and Ronald Reagan on the same uh, screen at the exact same time. I'm proud of that. Uh, Ronald Reagan is uh, famous for saying trust but verify, and they have a similar approach at Etsy. So Etsy uh, have a very high trust culture. Uh, almost everybody at Etsy on their first day releases code into production. Not developers even, like everybody, like I don't know, the person who waters the plants, I guess, releases code into production. Um, but having a high trust culture doesn't mean you don't test things, you don't verify. I don't even trust myself to test my own shit half the time, right? Like, you got to have it in there. You think about, the, I, I think about backups, right? Backups are no good if you have to actually run them, right? This is why things like Time Machine uh, with a time capsule are rad, because my stuff gets backed up, because I don't think about it. You know how often I back stuff up that requires me to plug in a drive and run a command? Never, right? How often do I test things that I have to remember to run the tests? Half the time. but. If my tests run every time, I, if the only way I can make a change to my infra infrastructure is by putting a change in into get, and then it gets picked up by a pipeline and the tests run, then 90% of the time it works 100% of the time. And we'll get tested 100% of the time. We also want to think about this idea of separation of concerns. I know earlier, you know, I, I you know, kind of made some hay out of making fun of sysadmins who think they're smarter because they've got root. But this is definitely a thing in this way. Right, uh, as I say, AKA my tests are failing, so I'll change the tests, AKA how I write code. Um, and what this means though, is that the person in charge of your compliance code should not be the same as the person writing the infra code. That's how development works, right? So one of the things, if I'm using an automated compliance, compliance as code type approach, I'm not gonna just simply say, okay, in my infra code or in my, in my pipeline, I have a place where I, I define the tests as well because they can be changed. So I wanna make sure whatever solution I'm using, I can separate those things off, right? I can say, no, you know what? Those the, the person who wrote the new infra code can't go in and just turn off the tests that they didn't like. So that's a really important piece of this puzzle. So we'll review a couple things, and then we'll take some questions, and then you know I guess everybody can get some drinks. Um, so things to bear in mind: trust but verify your domain experts, right? So trust that people want to do the right thing. Trust that people can do good work. Trust that people will make mistakes. So let's put some guardrails around them. Share the cooking. Don't try to do it all yourself. Nobody in this room works for Netflix. I have friends that work at Netflix. They don't know everything either, by the way, so don't you know, think anything's that. Leverage some type of style or lint analysis tool like Food Critic, something that's giving you, helping you enforce your standards. Use whatever your production audit process is in your pipeline. Whatever your, if you care enough about it to be running it in production, you sure as hell should be running it in test. And that just goes back for testing and monitoring in general. All that monitoring is is testing with a time dimension. So if you care enough to monitor something in production, you damn well better have tests for it, because otherwise you're gonna have a bad day. And by the way, did I mention that testing is important? So, uh, questions? What questions can I answer for you? Uh, pretend you know nothing. 
easily done. Okay, so the question for those of you who are watching a recording was, what's a good starter resource for Chef? Hey, look, it's on this slide. Uh, <laughs> I'll show you all these. So these are some other resources. Learn.chef.io uh, has some good tutorials to walk you through the first few. You don't even have to install anything. You can do it through some AWS stuff that we just, or uh, whatever the magic is behind the scenes. Um, for full disclosure and fairness of sharing, I don't remember, what's the URL for Puppet? What's your learning site? Learn.puppet Learn something? Okay, well, I tried. Uh, <laughs> but I do know one thing I remember from when I was first learning Puppet, because I learned Puppet before Chef. Um, one thing I thought was really rad that Puppet at least used to have was you could download like a learning VM that had all the stuff. Because we, we all try to make it so you don't have to like install shit to like give it a try. Any other questions, comments, problems with your life? Yeah. So the question was, where's the distinction between what goes in your monitoring tool, what goes in Nagios and what goes in server spec, right? So if you have long-lived infrastructure, right, that if your pipeline is very long-lived, then you could possibly just say, okay, I'm gonna throw Nagios agents on dev and QA and, and watch for that. The problem that I have with that is how do you ensure, how do you tie that into it being able to be released? Right, that, that's sort of the thing. It's like, because again, it's with a time dimension, right? So this is, I, I guess here's the difference. Monitoring is testing with a time dimension. It's testing over time, it's continually going. Testing is run a test. Give me the, give me the results of a thing that happened. Now, if you can, as much as possible, and this goes back to, I gave the example with compliance, but you could think about it for, for overall acceptance. Try to use the same kind of stuff, right? Because the more disparate your test is from your monitoring, the, then you start to have this drift, right? If you're like, well, I, this is, I defined it over here. So having a common language, and that's, again, not trying to like be the product pushy person, but this is the reason that we created Chef Compliance and Inspect, was to say we use the same language to define compliance in the real world with testing for compliance and functional before, and it's all in one place. So the, the more disparate your tooling, the more likely they're going to disagree with each other. I, I can hear you just fine, but that doesn't mean. I mean, the first thing I'll tell you is the vast majority, so it, before I was designing customers, I was working with prospective customers as a solution architect, and almost every one of my customers was legacy, brownfield, enterprise. I mean, just to put things in perspective, we're talking again about companies like General Motors, Ford, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, again, is as legacy as legacy as legacy. Like, they ain't moving shit to the cloud anytime soon. And so the practices to take under play is, first of all, what I usually recommend is don't take a thing that's already working and replace it with Chef and have nothing new come out of it. So I've had people do that before, like, and just to sort of put an example, let's say they're using Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager, which like gets them halfway there, and they're a big window shop, they're doing that. Then they say, great, we love this Chef thing, this is awesome, we're gonna Chef everything, so let's take all the stuff we're doing in SCM and write Chef code for that, and we're gonna spend six months doing that. At the end of six months, guess what they have? Nothing changed. <laughs> except they have a new tool. So what I do is I say, look at the stuff that isn't working and shim up that first. So in your, in your existing stuff, you're like, okay, you know, this is stuff that we know in according to our current build process or maybe things, this stuff never drifts, this doesn't change. There's ways you can go about that, right? 
you can think about, look at, uh, depending upon like what your ticketing system is or something like that, look at how you're spending your time. You know, if there's something that sysadmins are continually having to fix or things that you always do manually during a release and say, how can we go ahead and define this? And, and also another approach is just every time you have to make a change, make that, do that change in your infra code and then you never have to do it again, right? But if you kind of take this idea of I'm gonna, gonna try to draw up a big run book of, of everything at once, you're gonna have a project that never ends. And that's the thing, it never does end, nor should it. Um, the other thing that I wanna mention that your question made me think of that I get asked a lot is, isn't there some tool that I can just point at a running system and it'll create all the chef code to make a system that looks like that? And then my answer is, how does it know what you care about? How does it know, is it gonna define the 15,000 files on the file system and all of their ACLs and every running process and every single service and every single user? This, it's not magic, right? You have to, the hardest part of automation is knowing how to do the thing you want to do. Um, so if you, if you the, the final thing I think about with that is you need to be able to take a step back and like if I was helping you, I'd sit down and we'd say, okay, we're gonna write a cookbook for your Apache servers. They say, how do you build Apache servers today? And a lot of my customers, they hem and they haw and eventually it comes out and they're like, well, we, we do a VMware clone of the one that's already there. And then nobody actually knows how the systems are built. So you have to know that. You have to know the state you want. And that's how you approach it. You start by saying, what's the state I want it to be in? And then you break that down into resources. You say, the state I want it to be in is it's running this. That means it needs these packages, these files, these templates, et cetera. And then just sort of iterate down it, right? That's how I'd go. Mm -hmm. I would still pin the hell out of stuff. You always pin because in production. So the way that you would think about it, you're still gonna end up deploying the same mechanism, right? What, what you're gonna do is, and I guess I'll just repeat for the recording. You said in their organization, they're doing knife upload, they're using knife to manually upload the versions of the cookbooks and just saying it's fine that we put a newer version of the infra code out there on the chef server because the production environment is pinned to say only use this version, you have to go ahead and change it. That's not gonna change, that's still really good practice. Um, what doing in this matter is making it so that that can't be done, right? So you, you can't undo it, right? You know, so you're gonna do something, for example, excuse me, like your pipeline, which is the only way, like people, you're, you, the only user that has the rights to even upload cookbooks to your chef server is the Jenkins user, period. So first of all, if you wanna even go and do it, you can't. Second of all, it's only, it's only gonna do it by doing a Burks upload, which will force it to freeze the version of the cookbook so you don't accidentally overwrite a different kind of, you know, you're controlling it, so it's always done the same way. And then when you wanna get super slick, the way you do that migrate, that promotion, is so your environment files are just that, they're files. Guess where files can go? In a version control system, they can be vent linted, they can be tested. So if I'm saying, okay, so I have production.json that defines my production environment, it's got maybe some attributes in it or whatnot, but it also has for this cookbook version equal, the hardy quality operator to that, I wanna now promote the new one, I have to do it through version control. And that can have the human gate to the right person who can say yes, it changed, you know, and if they, and I've had customers get all kinds of complex with that where it ties into their service now and their change control and their idle and all this other stuff. So I think you have the right idea, but they take that step, take what you're doing with Knife and say, wouldn't it be cool if Chef Delivery or Jenkins did that instead, you know, after, as a result of the uh, successful tests? Yes, I learned at Chef. In fact, we just released a new uh, rebrand, uh, revamp tutorial um, because setting up the infrastructure for Chef Delivery just to in or, it's a, it's a lot of work to see if you even want to play with it, right? <laughs> so it's all done with a CloudFormation template with AWS. So as long as you have an AWS account, you go there. If you point it at a CFT, spins it up. You know, it'll take you half an hour to go through the tutorial, so it'll cost you a couple bucks. But then you'll see how it all, how that works, and that's precisely what it is, is it's moving. In the tutorial, it's about moving infra code, not just, not app code, but you could use app code as well, so. And then also, likewise, I mean, feel free to grab, I think I got cards somewhere if you wanna 
chat about it. I'm happy to nerd out about it. And then um, I put these slides are up on the event page thingy. Um, so you can, I guess, leave comments for them and stuff. This is like where you can find me. Um, and don't forget there's sprints on Friday. I won't be there, but I'm sure they'll be fun anyway. So you could still go. And if you want to <laughs> find my slides or leave comments, I made a bit.ly link of slash Drupal chef that'll take you to directly to the event page for this talk. You can talk about how awesome it was or how terrible it was or that, you know, my fly was open the whole time and I didn't realize it and y'all were, that's what you were really laughing at. But either way, thank you very much everybody. This was a lot of fun.